so good evening everybody it's good to see everyone um, just to start with uh, let me start by uh, thanking our organizers uh, bios lab uh, mr bharat solanki mr rastik parmar who have been all on toes throughout not just for this session but uh, they have been giving innovative uh, solutions and ideas since uh, the corona epidemic pandemic has started so i am thankful to them for giving me this opportunity to, in to interact with uh everyone also i welcome all of you we have got uh, participants uh, from all over india in fact i have just uh, got news that we have got doctors and friends joining from outside india as well i welcome them all we have got resident doctors my colleagues friends from all medical colleges of india so i am uh, welcoming everyone for the session and let's begin today's uh, discussion well uh, basics beyond basic coping the corona crisis uh, let's uh, begin by knowing one fact that uh, we are in a position to tell something that uh, yes we should uh, first of all be wishing corona virus uh, a very big congratulations for being the first thing made in china to last longer than a month as uh, chinese things are not very long lasting but yes we heard something which has uh, uh, lasted this long now uh, just uh, before we begin all right so just uh, let me clarify a declaration for uh, today's uh, discussion see we are still in the evolving phase of the uh, corona pandemic and we are yet to fully understand the disease all of us you and me last four months have been full of guidelines and publications apart from the workload we handle while working tirelessly in our covid units so uh, please remember what was true yesterday may not be true today and so on so what i would like to tell is uh our discussion today is not any expert sort of discourse rather uh, we will have a session of mutual sharing of experience and knowledge so at the end of the session i would like to have your experience working in the corona units and your experience with uh, various uh, facets we'll be discussing today and we'll be di discussing in four parts firstly we'll discuss in brief what we know over the last four months about covid and uh, corona related stuff where we stand few evidence based clinical implications and then we'll discuss few paper trials and controversies related to covid and we'll see what's the way ahead in coping the crisis as we all know you all would remember this tweet from march 11 2020 when who declared covid as pandemic uh, just following that in few days we got the first case in my state of gujarat that was on uh, march 19 2020 and uh, i was a part of the team uh, hosting the first patient of the state and since then we have had a roller coaster ride ups and downs so many new things so many changes so we'll discuss one by one so the saga has been the surge of an unknown virus filled with viral posts and whatsapp messages we didn't know what was true what was not true myths and myth busters we saw the rise of public private partnerships like never before we saw the guidelines and regulations which kept on modifying we saw real life application of what we call as the principles of community medicine and there came an era of sops well you won't believe uh, in fact just few days back i came across one sop on how to make an sop so that has been the case and of course we have trans uh, had the transition of all possible activities from uh, you know you know mechanical face to face platform to the online mode in fact just a couple of months back not very long back we used to have training sessions when i used to give training about covid just somewhere around march april but very soon the time has taken the turn and now we are uh, going away from face to face disruption in view of uh, social distancing and that's why we meet each other on webinars nowadays we learned the techniques of sanitization disinfection donning doffing of ppes cough etiquettes so we we don't feel we should discuss this things now we we should discuss something beyond this so over the last few months there has been an evolution of a cadre of doctors we call them as corona warriors definitely that has uh, changed uh, the way we look at our life the way we live our life and that we call it as the new normal so basic stuff about epidemiology etiology clinical presentation transmission 
the preventive practices we end the basic principle of management of covid we don't intend to discuss in our session we are having only session about 30 40 minutes so we'll focus on aspects other than uh, the basic ones uh, of course we'll also have some salient features about what we have been missing on the routinely discussed aspects about the common practices so we'll start with maskology so as we all know since the corona era started uh, there has been lot of talks and marketing about various type of masks uh, i remember initially the guidelines say that mask was not for everyone mask was only for those working in the healthcare setup but yes we have evolved over the months and we have now clear cut guidelines stating the use of mask for general population we have got studies stating that uh, those using either surgical or an n95 mask definitely have a, a better protection against the covid virus so that has uh, been the evolution over the last few months we can see in this slide uh, the surgical mask we get all types of masks basically uh, for routine common public uh, made up of various materials uh, out of them uh, the commonly prescribed and the most uh, reliable mask for general population is the surgical mask which uh, uh, gives much better protection compared to the uh, other variants right see comparing the surgical variety of the mask with the uh, one used for medicals which we use n95 so there is a, about 80% particle clearance in uh, uh, surgical mask whereas in our uh, n95 that we call it as respirator we get about 96 to or more than 95% clearance so definitely for uh, healthcare workers and medicals n95 and related masks are preferred if you look at the size of the corona virus it's somewhere around 0.1 micrometer now the filtering capacity as you as you would see in the subsequent slides of uh, the various n95 related masks and respirators uh, is up to 0.3 micrometer but still it is capable enough to give clearance for the corona virus which is even smaller than the 0.1 mic uh, 0.3 micron the reason being the brownian motion so uh, due to brownian motion smaller the particles Uh, it becomes more and more difficult to penetrate the uh, covering of the mask now see if we speak about various uh, standards of the mask uh, there are uh, primarily three standards of masks available all over uh, one of them is the us standard uh, which we can divide specifically for respirators we have the n prefix p prefix or r prefix uh, what we call it as n95 n99 and n100 the number 95 99 and 100 Uh, representative of uh, the number of clearance yeah, yeah, uh, done by that particular variety of the mask. Yeah. Similarly, the European standard uh, have the labeling of FFP1, FFP2, and FFP3. Now, if we just look at uh, the clearance of uh, particles more than 0.3 microns, we'll see yeah. that the clearance by FFP2 variant is almost similar to what we. have with our n95 95 that is more than 95% but in way okay uh of course there is one more variant variant of respirators available in the market known as kn95 now the k symbolic is representative of the chinese production or the chinese standard so the n95 we use as per the us standard is same as the ffp2 as per the uh, european standard similarly the kn95 as per the chinese standard is almost same as the n95 we use the only difference being in the making and the standard of production all right so now there is some misconception going on there is something known as mask with filters and mask without filters so this commonly what we see in the uh, attached to the n95 is basically not a filter we would say uh it is something which uh, we call it as all right it's not a filter it is something uh, known as valve so both the variants are available in the market but for a specifically covid purpose the ones uh, without valve non valve variants of n95 are definitely preferred for covid only for those patients uh, who are having asthmatic tendency or some other respiratory coexisting illness they may get better breathability in the valvular variants so if preferred you always go for the non valve variant so now uh, though 
respirators that is the n series r series or p series and the filter also have the n series r series and p series and the particular filtration that is 95% 99% and 100% so the only difference between the n series r series and p series is its resistance to oil so the n class filters are not resistant to oil the r class filters are oil resistant but they may be used uh, up to 8 hours the p class are the highest quality available by the various manufacturers they guarantee its usage up to 40 hours or 30 days whichever comes first and this have better filtrability for oily droplets and particles specifically may be useful for our orthopedic friends and dentists and ENT surgeon who may require to use bone drill for their uh, various operative procedures of course the N95 and Co are the disposable variants of the respirator now over the last few weeks we have seen the rise of uh, uh, reusable respirators basically uh, which we can use for a longer period they are also available in two variants one is the half phase variants and the full phase variants the half phase many of our colleagues and friends have started using the half phase variants please remember there is something known as a power hood or a helmet but it is not applicable for use in infectious disease it is for acid attacks and gas gaseous attacks and sewage workers so it's not applicable to using uh, in covid setup so the half phase variant may have the filters belonging to all categories this is the filter which is commonly used so they may have the n90 i mean p95 p99 or p100 part type of filter which is attached to the both both sides and the manufacturers uh, claim the filter may last up to 6 months with a shelf life of 5 years if you have not opened it so this is something which is coming coming up although nowhere recommended but if uh, someone is affording and willing you can uh, always use this so this is something about masks which we have discussed now we'll discuss something about the uh, testing strategies uh, for covid-19 so i'm not going to go into details about the icmr version of the pcr testing which was given on 18th of may 2020 which is followed till day uh, instead i'll speak on something which is just recently approved yet not available everywhere which is known as rapid antigen detection test for covid-19 uh, that is called the standard q covid-19 uh, antigen detection kit so basically it is a qualitative rapid chromatographic immunoassay uh, it is developed by a south korean company known as sd biosensor it is manufactured in india at uh, gurugram so this is something it, uh, which has come up and it's gradually going to get into the mainstream so uh, the antigen test standard q uses one mesopharyngeal swab please remember it is not a serological test it uses the nasopharyngeal uh, swab no other samples are required and it is uh, used with a viral extraction buffer also remember the routine vtm which we use for pcr technique is not uh, work, uh, workable does not work with the uh, covid-19 antigen detection test and the test has to be uh, completed at the site of the sample collection within one hour we can read the result with our naked eyes within 15 minutes it has been approved by icmr and aims delhi it has got uh, fairly good specificity around 99 to 100 percent but the sensitivity is very low also please remember this is an antigen detection test rapid antibody detection tests are not yet recommended for the diagnosis of covid 19 infection this is a antigen detection test so owing to the high specificity and low sensitivity the specific indications for uh, testing uh, with antigen testing include in the containment zone all the symptomatic uh, patients with uh, influenza like illness and the asymptomatic direct and high risk uh, contacts with comorbidities uh, and the testing is done on day 5 to 10 similarly in the healthcare settings uh, we test all symptomatic influenza like illnesses uh, presenting in the healthcare setup along with those who are ongoing with chemotherapy or are immunosuppressed or having some malignant disease and the most contro controversial part uh, for elective and emergency surgical procedure as well as uh, non-surgical intervention like bronchoscopy and uh, endoscopy and hemodialysis yes that can be used but please remember there is a caveat with this so the use of the antigen detection test for the above indication should be uh, uh, done along with the gold standard PCR test. So, if the tests are posi positive, the test should be considered as the true positive owing to the high specificity. But if the uh, test is negative, then we need to conf confirm the negativity by using our uh, standard uh, uh, RT-PCR testing. 
and yeah so this is something which has come up so now speaking about covid radiology so radiological diagnosis being one of the main tools which we apply while using it for covid 19 so as we all know plain radiographs are the first line of investigation we uh, do although it is less sensitive than the ct chest the findings are most prominent on day 10 12 and the most frequent findings which can be observed uh, are usually air uh, space opacities you can see in this uh, uh, image which i have put up so the opacities mainly are bilateral and have a peripheral distribution specifically in the lower zone so we'll speak about the role of ct thorax then so please remember ct thorax does not add to the diagnostic value basically so there may be a false uh, negative result which may give rise to a false sense of uh, security so if at all we need to use it we prefer a plain ct thorax uh, the finding on the ct thorax uh, may be directly correlating with the severity of the lung pathology or the disease however the ct thorax is having a very low negative predictive value so it's not recommended not at all useful as a screening test also there is overlap in the findings with other diseases like h1n1 and other viral pneumonitis so the radiological society of north america has given a structure reporting pattern for uh, reporting of the uh, hrct thorax or the ct thorax uh, where the findings are divided into typical intermediate atypical and negative categories wherein you can punch the findings and put them in one of these four categories. The least skew typical findings, it includes GGO, what we call it as ground glass opacities, which are multifocal, peripheral and basally uh, distributed. Uh, there may be evidence of vascular thickening and there may be rarely a presence of a halo sign. So these are the ground glass opacities, which are peripherally distributed. Evident, this is the vascular thickening which we see. Now, see the these findings are more specific to COVID-19 related uh, CT thorax, specifically the ground glass opacity and the peripheral distribution. Also, the reverse cell sign is uh, more seen compared to non-COVID cases. As well as what we should remember is findings like pleural effusion, lymphadenopathy, lung nodule and cavitation. These are usually not, almost never seen with COVID-19 infection. So these findings, if you find on a chest X-ray or a CT thorax, pleural effusion, lymphadenopathy, lung nodule, then you may uh, need to have a very strong suspicion before calling it uh, go for COVID testing. Otherwise, you should look for alternate uh, pathologies. So we follow something known as computerized oncology radiation and data system or CORETS for uh, determining the level of suspicion. The radiologist does this, uh, where the typical findings which we discussed uh, just recently are placed into CORETS category five. Now, if this category is combined with uh, uh, what we call it as PCR positive re result, then we uh, get to call it as CORETS 6. See, you can see in this image a beautiful hello sign or a reverse hello sign, which is classically seen in COVID-19 infections. All right. So that was all about radiological aspect. Now let's discuss something about the cytokine storm. So speaking of the etiopathology or the pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19 infection, various theories have come up. The most acceptable so far being the one of uh, cytokine storm, uh, which says that the initial viremia uh, gets settled in the respiratory bronchioles, which lead uh, to a host inflammatory response, what we call it as the hyperinflammation. And then the host inflammatory, uh, you know, particles, they attack the host immune system, what we call it as the uh, a cytokine storm. So we have got a rise. So there were studies which showed the rise in pro-inflammatory cytokines in the plasma of COVID-19 patients who are requiring ICU admissions compared to those not requiring ICU admission. And there was a specific rise of cytokines and chemokines. Uh, important ones to remember being interleukin-6 and the chemokines like CXCL10 and CXCL8, which are the most prominent ones raised in cases of uh, cytokine storm. So uh, this leads to a, uh, what we call as uh, autoimmune, something like an autoimmune response or, or the specific term which we call in this case is a hyperimmune state. So the immune system attacks the components of our body, of our body 
and leads to uh, features of ARDS, vascular hyperpermeability, and eventually multi organ failure and death of the patient. Now, Categorically speaking about interleukin-6, it has got very pleiotropic properties uh, in the sense that it is secreted by almost all hematological as well as stromal cells. Uh, so the virus dependent, uh, virus driven, dose dependent production of interleukin-6 is there in the bronchial epithelium. It activates the helper uh, T cells that is the TH17. TH17 are pro-inflammatory triggers and it in turn activates the cell mediated immunity leading to the cytokine storm. Also, the high levels of interleukin-6 are suggested as predictors for COVID-19 disease severity. Why, why we are discussing, uh, discussing this is because we have got something known as tocilizumab, which is an anti-interleukin-6 receptor antibody, which is used for. So this is the paper uh, prospective large study uh, studying uh, tocilizumab, which has indicated the consideration for using tocilizumab in uh, patients with moderate COVID-19 infection. Of course, it is an off-label indication for patients having uh, progressively increasing oxygen requirement over 24 to 48 hours and in uh, mechanically ventilated uh, patients, but they should have been tried with steroids first, then and then only if they are not improving on steroids, then only trial of tocilizumab can be given. So the high suspicion for cytokine storm, as we all know, can be raised by uh, supported by increased levels of serum interleukin-6, increased ferritin, increased C-reactive protein, and increased D-dimer. Of course, the patient on tocilizumab should be monitored for secondary infections and neutropenia, and active infections and tuberculosis should be ruled out before its use. The dose is uh, 8 mg per kg given IV slowly in 100 ml uh, normal saline over 1 hour, and can be repeated if required after 12 to 24 hours. Now, uh, see, in cases of cytokine storm, it's always uh, uh, good to try liver trial of our old time-tested controversial agent, and that is our steroids. Now, there have been controversies with uh, steroids. The initial studies which uh, we got before the, uh, the entire COVID era started were from the studies in the MERS uh, uh, coronavirus and the influenza a related studies where it uh, was shown that there is increased risk of mortality and delayed viral clearance. So initially we were hesitant in using steroids in cases of COVID-19. However, some initial COVID related uh, observational studies, not randomized control trials, were uh, uh, of the opinion that uh, if given early in the patients with uh, moderate disease, it may have beneficial outcomes. So initial recommendations for moderate disease included in injection methylprednisolone, which can be used for either moderate disease or severe disease if the oxygen requirement is increasing and if the inflammatory markers are raised. If steroid response is not there, then we can shift over to tocilizumab. So this was the story so far. Now this is something which has happened over the last week or so. Um, see, there is something which has come up. Uh, basically, it's called the recovery trial, uh, which has, uh, although it's not a published trial yet, uh, it's a UK-based uh, trial. I'll, tell about it just in a while. So it has shown that IV as well as oral dexamethasone reduced the 28 day mortality rate by 17% of amongst the hospitalized patients who required either ventilatory or uh, oxygenation support. Please remember the benefit was not seen for patients who did not require oxygen. In fact, in the United Kingdom, dexamethasone has been approved for all hospitalized patients with COVID-19 requiring oxygen. So about the recovery trial, it is a UK-based large randomized control trial in the NHS uh, hospitals. It is still ongoing and the data which has come up is not a proper publication. It is just an unpublished reports which are out. Uh, apart from your uh, dexamethasone, it is also testing lopinavir, riptonavir, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, tocilizumab and convalescent plasma. So it would be interesting to keep a watch on the other findings which we'll be getting eventually about this UK-based recovery trial. All right, so now COVID-19 associated coagulopathy. So as we know about disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, in cases of COVID-19, we have seen uh, a coagulopathy which is basically distinct from, but has overlapping features with uh, our routine DIC. So it is a hypercoagulable state just like the compensated DIC but the difference being in 
uh, in cases of covid associated coagulopathy the major finding is thrombosis whereas in cases of acute decompensated dic the major finding is bleeding so the left findings may uh, include uh, pt epitty which may be normal or slightly raised platelets which may be normal or raised uh, fibrinogen which is raised in cases of cac yeah, in comparison with dic where it is low the d dimer which is raised in dic is also raised in cac also the d dimer correlates with the severity of disease and also there is a increase in the factor 8 activity and increase in von willebrand factor so the pathophysiology goes hand to hand with uh, the that of cytokine storm along with the cytokine storm there is activation of the coagulation pathways specifically there is activation of thrombin which is the key uh, element for uh, uh, your csc so thrombin apart from being pro thrombotic also exerts various cellular effects and can further augment the inflammation it may cause endothelial damage as well as it activates the hemostatic uh, mechanism it causes mi uh, microvascular uh, thrombi which causes obstruction at tissue level causing hypoxia specifically in the lungs which is the most affected organ now why we are discussing this is because uh, recently what has come up in the journal for critical care is about a new paradigm in the thromboprophylaxis for critically ill patients and they have given this uh, summarization uh, i'll explain in brief what it is see as we all know uh, prophylactic doses of lower molecular weight heparin are usually recommended recommended in most medical patients which are admitted to the hospital however recent studies suggest the benefit of anticoagulation in severely ill covid 19 patients with an important reduction in mortality so this is something new which is coming up also lower molecular weight uh, weight heparin has anti inflammatory properties which might be beneficial in covid 19 patients so this has led to a new curiosity which uh, may recommend use of little bit higher dose of uh, lmwh uh, compared to what we use it in prophylactic doses so what has been suggested is that all covid 19 patient admitted to the hospital must primarily be assessed for their hemorrhagic as well as thrombotic risk i'll tell you how to do that so unless contraindicated lmwh sabko de hi dena hai as a prophylactic dose prophylactic dose means enoxaparin 40 mg od however in those patients where we see the pro coagulant profile by uh, calculating the sic score then they may be considered for giving a higher dose of uh, enoxaparin that is enoxaparin 40 mg bd so that is something new which has uh, come up recently uh, so for uh, calculating the thrombotic tendency uh, we calculate what is known as the sepsis induced coagulopathy score which is already existing since many years and it has been incorporated for use in cases of covid so we all know about the sofa score so we first calculate the total sofa which is the combination of the four components of sofa score that is the respiratory part the cardiovascular part the liver part and the renal part and if the uh, sum of the points given in these four components is two or more then we give a score of two to total sofa and if the total of these four components is one then we give a score of one to total sofa and then we put this calculation of total sofa in the calculation for sic score see so the sic score includes prothrombin time the uh, coagulation uh, profile in terms of platelet count and the total sofa now all this score put together if the total score is four or more then we may, may consider it as eligible for higher dose or the therapeutic dose uh, anticoagulation uses and for the cal calculation of hemorrhaging tendency we can use scores like your his blood score so this what we discussed uh, just now uh, what is uh, the sic score has been incorporated in this recent guideline by the ministry of health and family welfare which was published on 13th of june 2020 and it has given a specific indication for a calculation of sic score and then giving enoxaparin to all the patients at a higher dose if indicated so there are several changes and several new aspects of this recent protocol given by mohfw as well as something else which we will eventually discuss well uh, the discussion won't be over if we don't discuss something which has raised all the eyebrows all throughout the continents of the world uh, the controversial h drug that is the hydroxychloroquine 
so very initial uh, findings were based on in vitro uh, activity of SARS-CoV-2 against the uh, in vitro activity of HCQ against the SARS-CoV-2 uh, as indicated by several small single center trials. However, after that, large observational studies came up, uh, which have uh, shown that there is no effect of HCQ on the uh, mortality and other clinically uh, meaningful outcomes. So still there are uh, many more studies uh, going for its antiviral role as well as for role in chemoprophylaxis about XCQ, but it has seen its all share of controversies. We'll discuss few controversies. So what happened was uh, in the, I, I don't think there has been a similar, uh, similar case in the history of, uh, you know, scientific research and publication as has been the case with uh, hydroxychloroquine. So there was a paper published uh, in Lancet, one of the most prominent publishers uh, journal. Uh, by a group of scientists and what happened was it has it had to be retracted after publication so never has such a thing happened that someone has to retract the paper after publication similar article by the same group of scientists was also published in uh, NEJM which also had to be retracted so this is something I'll tell you what happened is uh, see the data which was pulled uh, while publishing this uh, paper or article uh, was uh, sought or uh, pulled by a company known as Surgisphere. And this Surgisphere uh, had some issues with uh, the data. They said that there are, they have evaluated 90,000 plus patients, but they were not able to give the actual data. And the scientists themselves recommended for retraction of this article. And all through this controversy, the WHO has stayed totally confused. So the WHO had a trial known as a solidarity trial, uh, which had hydroxychloroquine at its one arm. Now, the moment this controversial study was published initially before retraction, WHO stopped its hydrochloroquine arm, hydroxychloroquine arm of the solidarity trial. However, then this controversy came up and the surgery sphere issue came out and the articles were retracted. So the moment these articles were retracted, the WHO resumed the hydroxychloroquine trial, which was initially posed. Now we were, we were just at this. Okay, so we just got this news and after a few days, we heard about the recovery trial. Now the recovery trial also had one arm of hydroxychloroquine. Now what happened that the hydroxychloroquine arm of the recovery trial uh, showed no beneficial effect of hydroxychloroquine in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. So they themselves stopped uh, enrolling the patients uh, for uh, the hydroxychloroquine arm and they retracted their uh, hydroxychloroquine arm altogether. Just after that uh, came the recommendation from FDA and they revoked their emergency use authorization of uh, hydroxychloroquine for use in COVID-19. It just came recently on 15th of June. And just after the declaration by FDA, again, uh, WHO followed its footsteps and uh, it uh, again stopped its hydroxychloroquine trial in the arm of, as an arm of solidarity trial. So as on date, all the recommended proposals by international authorities have been withdrawn for hydroxychloroquine, including WHO. Same is the case with uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. This paper you can see published in NEJM said that there, it did not demonstrate a significant benefit of hydroxychloroquine as a post-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19. However, for pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, uh, still ongoing trials are there. Particularly, I would like to, I would like you guys to keep a watch on this trial which is going on in France. It's called covid Axis. Uh, it's still ongoing and the results are, uh, I think, expected by November. It's testing uh, chemoprophylaxis in exposed healthcare workers. So we'll keep an eye on this trial. So the current trend in India about hydroxychloroquine as recommended by Indian guidelines include usage for mild and mo moderate COVID-19 infections, as well as we still continue to use it as chemoprophylaxis in asymptomatic healthcare work workers, whether or not working in COVID, asymptomatic frontline worker, the policemen and others working in COVID related duties, as well as asymptomatic household contacts. Now, if we discuss about our experience on using hydroxychloroquine, as what I have discussed with many other uh, colleagues and consultants throughout India, uh, although not recommended or not published in any trial, definitely those 
uh, who those healthcare workers who had been taking hydroxychloroquine have definitely noticed at least a milder form of covid infection if it was uh, the case the infection so this is something which is not published anywhere but has been uh, discussed uh, amongst our circle right so uh, along with uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, another antiviral property was studied that of remdesivir so this article published in any jam uh, suggested that uh, remdesivir as an antiviral drug was superior to placebo in shortening the time to recovery time to recovery bole to those who were taking remdesivir recovered in recovered after 11 days of hospitalization compared to those on placebo who took around 15 days to recover and yes it has been approved for moderate covid-19 uh, infection for uh, patients on oxygen but those patients who do not have any uh, hepatic or renal impairment and it should not be given in pregnant female or lactating female or children of course the use is uh, recommended only as an emergency use authorization in india the dose being 2000 mg iv on day 1 followed by 100 mg iv for 5 days so similar is the case with uh, convalescent plasma many trials are ongoing uh, one of the recent papers published in jama on 3rd june uh, says that it did not show a significant <coughs> improvement in time to uh, clinical improvement within 28 days so uh, no significant benefit was shown as per this jama jama trial so in india convalescent plasma is uh, an off label recommendation in considering in uh, considering in covid 19 which uh, moderate covid 19 infections in patients who are either not improving or uh, on oxygen despite use of steroids so steroids again tocilizumab also after use of steroids convalescent plasma also after use of steroids also of course there are few special prerequisites which i don't think i should go into detail for now and the dose being variable now something else has come up which is called early self proning in awake but no need to better patients now uh, we all know the role of prone position ventilation in uh, the management of ards but something else which has come up is uh, in awake and non intubated patient so any covid 19 patient with respiratory embarrassment severe enough to be admitted to the hospital may be considered for rotation and early self proning i'll show you a picture just in a minute uh, in such a manner that uh, uh, it does not disturb the oxygen flow of the uh patient so the protocol which has been given is by nih which includes uh 30 minutes to 2 hours of rotation for the patient firstly in the prone position then in the right lateral position then in the sitting position again in the left lateral position all uh positions for 30 minutes to 2 hours and finally you can again uh put back to the uh prone position so this is something which is known as early self proning in awake and non intubated patient and it has also been in, in, uh, incorporated in the recent guidelines of MOHFW which i just showed a couple of slides back so uh, speaking of all these things uh, this was almost all which we had to discuss for the day so what is the way ahead now so let me tell you it was still that years probably a decade to develop the full understanding about covid 19 infection our current concepts about covid-19 might evolve and change over time so what is the way ahead so the way ahead is keeping an eye on the progress in terms of vaccines and other investigational therapies as well as other management aspects or uh, related to covid-19 which eventually come up and then apply it in the best interests of our patients for example we should keep an eye on the vaccination uh, trials there are almost 140 candidate uh, vaccines which are undergoing various phase of clinical trials in fact two of them have already reached the phase 3 of the uh, uh, trial one of them is uh, from usa uh, seattle based study that vaccine is known as mrna1273 the other one in uh, the third phase being from china beijing based uh, vaccine known as sinovac so uh, we should keep an eye on this uh, also in case of uh, classical vaccines the clinical trials take up to 10 to 10, 12 years however for uh, uh, the pandemic uh, situation the trial has been speed forwarded uh, to almost 18 months so
probably in a year or so, we may expect one of these uh, candidate vaccines to be the final vaccine for COVID-19. So we need to keep an eye on the various uh, vaccines. Also, there are various other therapies in trial, that being lopinavir, ritonavir, favipiravir, which is an inhibitor of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, favipiravir individually as well as in combination with umifinovir, interferon 1 beta. Of course, there is a monoclonal antibody against uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus known as uh, 47D11, which is also being tried. Also, there is Gimcilumab, which is an IV antibody to GMCSF. This is also in phase three trial right now. Of course, other medications are also on, uh, under trial, azithromycin, ivermectin, BCG vaccine, and so on. So we should keep a watch on all these uh, trials which are ongoing. Uh, if at all, we get to have some other weapon while fighting with the COVID virus. See, this is the monoclonal antibody trial. Another trial with triple combination of interferon, lopinavir, ritonavir, and ribavirin. Something which has come up uh, has been the highlight of all the media over the last couple of days about the oral antiviral Febiflu, that is Febipiravir, which has been made available in India just recently. Maybe we'll get a hand on it within a day or two. Uh, it has been approved uh, under emergency authorization. Uh, as an oral antiviral drug for mild to moderate COVID-19 infection. Probably we can try it as an alternative to what we had been using uh, with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the only thing uh, we should take care is uh, the age group should be 18 to 75 and informed signed consent of the patient himself or herself is required before starting uh, the patient on favipiravir. Uh, the packaging consists of 34 tablets and the dosing is uh, each tablet being a uh, of 200 milligrams. So the dosing on day one is 1800 milligram, that is nine tablets BD. And from day two, we can give up to 14 days, not necessarily 14 days, up to 14 days at a dose of 800 milligram uh, BD, that would make four tablets two times a day. So if we keep a total of all of this, uh, say if you give for 14 days, uh, uh, total 122 tablets would be required. And if at all we calculate the price, the package of 34 tablets is available is costing 3500 rupees. So approximately uh, 103 rupees per tablet and you can calculate accordingly the total costing. So that's it for today's discussion. So I would like to share a slide which I have compiled various reliable sources for information related to COVID-19. And these are also the references of the discussion which we have got today. You can take a screenshot if you want and keep a watch on various guidelines uh, as per the Ind Indian context, as per the international uh, context, the guidelines and various updates. And of course, the publications and trials. And also various international ag agencies who have given their own guidelines, their own paper, their own studies. You can keep an eye. You can get to know uh, what is going on there. So that's it guys. Uh, ultimately, uh, we all know that uh, at somewhere inside our heart, we know that it is a Chinese virus, so it's not going to last long. So sooner or later, we are going to come out of our uh, uh, nutshells in a crisis and we are going to get back to our normal lives. Uh, and we definitely need to have the confidence and faith in our abilities, faith in our leaderships and faith in God to come out of the crisis. So I don't have a take home message because all of us are already sitting at our home. So that's it. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, let me just tell you at the end, we have already defeated swine flu. So we shall surely defeat the coronavirus as well. So just have faith and confidence and keep going. So if there is some interesting uh, uh, experience from your side, I would like to hear it if uh, stick by me, unmute few participants who are willing to share their experiences during the Corona crisis. Or what you can do is I have made a telegram group with a beautiful 3D live article of uh, COVID virus, uh, which is accessible in telegram. The group is known as COVID-19 Research Outreach India. You can access that in uh, telegram by typing COV India. So we can have a discussion over there as well. You can put up your questions. Also, I'm going to share this PowerPoint presentation on this group. 
so those who are interested for research and uh, publication related discussions you are most welcome to join the group i think uh, that is it for the discussion